and welcome to From the Rookery End. Uh, we are post Watford losing at home to Huddersfield 2 1. What a day it wasn't. Uh, my name is John, uh, and with us on this podcast, uh, I'm joined by DCW. How are you, Dave? I'm good. I'm okay. Been a couple of days since Saturday, so I've kind of got uh, gotten over the initial, you know, disappointment and, uh, you know, realization yeah. that things actually are probably not going to be very good this season. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, there was a point of thinking if we tried to do a podcast on Saturday after the game, I would have got nothing from you. You were quite in the bad place, um, as can happen after football matches. And for the second time, uh, we're joined by Mr. Matt Furness. Good evening, Matt. Hello, how are you? Well, yeah, as Dave sort of said, footballing wise, not great, but you know, everything else is, is pretty cool. We're doing this on Monday evening, and it's born to, to contextualise a couple of things here. Um, nothing wants to be dated too quickly, but of course, we are aware of all the rumours that been going on about the possibilities of Valerian having been sacked and someone coming in, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going to necessarily talk about that directly because we want it to be a fully formed thing, if it is a thing, and reflect on that um, going forward. But I'm sure it will creep into our discussions that we do today with. With Matt, where we're going to, as we have did with this data podcast that we did previously with Matt, just sort of trying to get these ideas, these feelings, these things that we see as, as a normal football fan, which I like to call myself, um, and try and put the data that Matt has in his work at Opta to make sense of it, or maybe highlight things that we hadn't seen and maybe start feeling differently towards it. So so Matt, the, the, the thing I suppose we've, we've seen and we felt again uh, on Saturday was this home just terrible home form. Um, and as Mike keep pointing out to us on our WhatsApp group, but the, the it's minimum going to be 99 days uh, before Watford actually get a home win. The, you know, this diff- you know, it's easy to look at home form and away form and, and sort of say wins and losses and draws and, and not. What have you got then from, from this home form that you or looking at the data, the home and away, what's, what are the differences? The sort of main talking point here is that obviously we've been, poor at home this season we've won what 20 points from 17 games at Vicarage Road which even if we win our final six home games will be one point fewer than last season uh, at home um, so whatever we're, we're doing it's going gonna, it's gonna to be lower the hunch I had and I think I raised this in the last time it is the the pressure put on the team by fans and and the at neg- negative atmosphere isn't helping. I think like we talked about the Cardiff game where it turned sour quite quickly. It was similar kind of this weekend where there was quite a lot of passing backwards towards the goalkeeper. Uh, and yeah. that raised boos from the fans. Not helpful again. I think at that point it was nil nil. It started at about 15, 16 minutes. And it's just, I, for me, I was... I got quite angry about it because it's like, how's this ever going to help anybody in any mm. shape or form by you vocalising it so obviously? And some of them, and I think maybe because some of the people around us were raging, absolutely yeah. raging about things. And you do, I do start turn around and say, I do understand when you think pass the ball around the back is a bit boring, but have you not watched any other modern day games of football recently? This isn't a new thing at all. John, I'm normally one of the first ones to kind of... Um, get annoyed at people who are getting annoyed themselves about goalkeepers passing out from the back and doing all that for the reasons you just said, right? It's part of the game. We know why when it works, it works. But I'm going to give the the general fan base a little bit of slack, I think, for Saturday because as evidenced by the reaction from the manager, it was bad. It was really bad. Mm. Like among the worst we've seen this season, if not the very worst. And it wasn't just the passing out from the back. We're used to that. It was just sort of the general lethargy of the performance. You know, the midfield, they were just like sort of shuffling around, kind of sticking legs out, like all those classic sort of hallmarks of a team that just don't look at it at all. And he, he made the changes. But like there was palpable frustration in that in the stadium. And, and yeah, maybe some old wounds are starting to be reopened, right, that we thought perhaps had been healed. And, and you know, that sort of... That kind of anger and frustration and bad feeling is is, is actually quite, you know, isn't isn't that far below the surface. So I think I, I get it. I get why the the reaction because we were looking at each other just to go, oh, Christ, like what's going on here? It's the toxic environment and the, the players quite obviously some of them go into their shells in that environment and it's not helping. It's kind of, well, it's 
it's, it's, it works both ways, isn't it? I think the fans do need to try and find a positive angle sometimes. And uh, okay, if you're in the 75th minute and we're still doing that, Go either one nil down or nil nil, then yeah. maybe it's justifiable. But that, I mean, the last three years we've had, we've won five games this season at home. We won 11 last season. But the, the season before we won two in the Premier League, that is 18 in the last three seasons we've won uh, at home. That is fewer than that promotion season where we were all robbed of watching us get promoted. Yeah. So we haven't actually seen a, a Watford team perform well at home for many years because that final Premier League season we got relegated in, I think before COVID, we only won four at home. And then we won two after uh, without fans. So we, we haven't seen much at home. I think the Luton home game last season, probably the, the pinnacle is probably the best we've seen. I've been looking at kind of game states this season. Explain that again, over, what are game states? So it's kind of winning, losing, drawing. Okay. We've only been leading, this is overall, not just at home, we've been leading for 528 minutes this season. That is including all added time, first half, second half. Um, 106 of those minutes were in the opening game. So that's 20% of uh, those minutes were in the opening game. Now at home, we've played 1,695 minutes, including added time. We've been in the lead for just 307 of those. Um, And again, excluding that opening day win over QPR, that is 201 minutes we've been leading in the last 16 home games in the league, which is appalling and like you can kind of that is one justifiable thing about fat this it's rubbish like we've never had this high and probably if you take that Rotherham game out as well where we led quite early in that match that would be maybe 150 minutes or something like that it's it's ridiculous it's, it's all of two um, games really isn't it but Val came out I don't know if it was this week or last week sort of saying well so we like to take our time in these games and try and suss out the opposition it takes 20 or 25 minutes which is insane. It was just kind of like as a tactic of just like, well, we're just going to wait and see how they're playing and then we'll decide how we're going to do. It's like, where is your match preparation? Are you not doing this? Is it like, it's like your Sunday league. You're kind of like, I don't know who's going to turn up. Um, We'll see how they're playing and then we'll just uh, kind of like, yeah, build on that. It's almost admitting you're weak or you're weaker than your opponent you're then trying to find ways that oh well, we can maybe match up here. Um, it's just yeah a strange thing, and and that's not helping Ishmael. Coming out with those kind of quotes is just going to turn people against him, and obviously make Pozzo think he's losing it. Well, I honestly, like, I mean, a little bit on Saturday, like he did say after that one, he did say after the game that they did change things, and he clearly did change things after 26 minutes. Yeah. But the fact that you know they have a new manager. So you think, oh, maybe in a game like that where they've got a new manager, they're trying different things, that player is playing to that player, and just this slightly different way. And you may be in a certain games where you would sort of say, well, we're going to see what happens and we're going to re- react to it. The, they definitely don't have the confidence of being a team where they said, this is how we win games of football. We had, we've never seen that. And I don't think I don't mm. think they know how they're going to do that. It's when you don't have any strikers <laughs> or any you know yeah. uh, massive you know knowledge of how games can be won. You're never going to have that. The problem with that, John, is that Ishmael came out before the game and even on the Watford Watford social channels pushed this out about his pre-match interview where he's saying, we know Huddersfield really well. We know how they play. I know this manager. I've I've faced him before Mm -hmm. and I know how he plays. So we're well prepared. And then to come out of a performance like that, where it was quite obviously you're not prepared and you've had a whole week to know how Huddersfield might play, was baffling, really. I, I found Saturday really disappointing, probably less so than the Norwich game, because I thought that, I mean, Norwich were like the Watford fans that day. It was toxic there at Carrow yeah. Road when we got we got to two. It was toxic when they were winning two one, and then when we got to two all, I thought there's only one winner here, and we just collapsed. And that kind of has followed that kind of Cardiff game where it was a bit like that, and then Huddersfield this weekend as well. Um, but I've got some more kind of in-depth data looking at the way we're playing at home and away this season overall. Mm. So this really is nerdy stuff. So Bring it we're on. looking at passing sequences. So passing sequences are where it's like a string of passes in a move. So we'll call it a passing move. That passing sequence ends when the opposition get the ball or it goes out of play. So a passing sequence at home this season we're averaging a passing sequence of 3.7 passes um, 
which when you think we probably string together, what, 40 to 80 sequences of passes over a 90-minute match. Yeah, you're averaging 3.7 there. Away from home, we average 3.2. So it doesn't sound a lot, but that 0.5 difference when you're having that many passing sequences is quite big. Um, So we keep more of the ball at home, and that's definitely displayed with that ponderous kind of passing around the back, uh, stringing it from left to right until we find... Uh, an avenue to progress the play. Um, sequence time is the average time that you have in that passing sequence. So in home games, we average passing sequences of just under 11 seconds. Away from home, that's two seconds shorter. So we have less passes in the passing sequence. We keep the ball for less time. We're probably slightly more counter-attacking, as you would expect as a, an away side. Um, and then you have another metric called directness, Um, Now, that is the percentage of the total distance covered per sequence that is upfield. So that's kind of telling you how direct are you playing? Yeah, that that was my question, because how many of those passing sequences included three along the back? Well, at home, our directness is 21.7%. Of the the field? The percentage of the total distance covered per sequence is upfield. So 21.7% of our passing sequences go upfield. Away from home, that's 25.3%. So that's a nearly a 4% rise. We progress it quicker despite having fewer passes. Maybe a bit more chaotic. There's a bit more transition there. There are games like Preston, Plymouth, Blackburn that might skew that slightly, um, where they were chaotic games and we did get through those teams quite quickly. But we average more, nearly 100 passes more, successful passes more per game at home. Um, we have a lot more of the ball. Um, there is a higher proportion of those in the final third. Um, but yeah, it's what you're doing with those passes really, isn't it? Um, and then I've looked at some data home and away, looking at the chances we create, the quality of those chances. So overall this season, we actually create lower quality chances overall away from home than we do at home. Um, but the quality of each of those shots is higher. So we create better quality chances less frequently. At home, an average shot will have a 0.08 XG. So that would be, the average shot conversion of that would be 8%. Away from home, that is 0.10. So 10% average shot conversion rate. We are outperforming that conversion rate, both home and away. um, But our shot conversion rate away from home is 11.6%. And that's much higher than at home at 10.1%. So we're creating better quality chances away from home and we're converting a lot more of them because it's probably a bit more that we're counter-attacking maybe and there's more space in transition. Could you understand that in a sense of why he maybe... We take too long at home. Is it slow? Is it, is it slow? Is it cautious? It's slow and cautious. And by the time that we get in these positions out wide where we might want to create chances, the opposition have set themselves defensively. It's just very ponderous at home. It looks lethargic. A lot of that, again, I personally feel is down to the atmosphere making players a bit more nervous. And I, I understand fans thinking that's insane because they're professional footballers, but that would play on you a little bit. So do you think, Dave, that is more to do with a purposeful way of approaching the football matches from Valerian, from the, from the management? Or is it, do you think, the, the players reacting to this slightly negative uh, tones that come from the uh, from the stands. I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think it what it actually does is it, it speaks to Ishmael's kind of inflexibility. In the, so, r- kind of roughly based on those numbers, playing the same within a within a bit of a there's a little bit of variance there. But we're kind of the, the, the approach is the same. But when we're at home. The, 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 the different thing is is what the opposition are doing in those two games. Because when we're at home, the opposition is playing like an away team and kind of letting us have the ball and sitting back and countering on us. When it's the other way round, we're better because they're at home and they're rising and they're maybe playing different and they're 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 being more attacking and they're sort of have more of the ball and more more of the uh, you know the onus is on them to be the home team, obviously. So it just it seems that we're not good, you know, tactically in terms of the way we're playing. We don't have the right players and we're not good enough to be the sort of team that Val wants us to be at home, whereas away from home, we're better. But then when when you add the fans into that mix, 
it kind of exacerbates the whole the whole situation. Like I will come on to that tactical inflexibility a bit later. But there was another thing on Saturday, which I I talked to you guys about on Saturday, which is the double substitution in the first half. I I actually when he made it, I thought he's made the right choice here. I think that, that central midfield trio were having a nightmare, and I I don't. I didn't really see much of Kayembe, to be honest, in that game. Um, but Kone, that substitution was made purely out of anger from Ishmael, I could mm. tell. And that's why Kone stormed off. And it was that's not a good sign, I don't think. A manager letting his anger kind of come across in that way. I can understand it because Kone, as good as he is, is <laughs> he's he's very kind of like I don't know if it's naivety or inexperience, or that he just thinks he's better than everyone else, he's pig-headed, or kind of just stubbornly does things. But he'll do things which you can tell are completely away from tactical instruction um, in central midfield. Now, that can be great at times because it it's exciting when players do things that kind of you don't, they're not drilled to do. But at times that can also cause problems. And on Saturday, that did cause problems. He mm. wasn't doing the job that Ishmael asked him to do. So he basically said, well, you two, you come off then and I'll put two players on who will do exactly what I want them to do. Now, I pointed out there's a goal that we conceded against Leicester in, um, at home, which I absolutely lost it in the stands because I could see it coming. <laughs> And again, I'm going to blame the fans here a little bit because there was so much pressure. It's the second goal, wasn't it? The second goal from Leicester, not the penalty. Every time their goalkeeper had the ball, the fans were going insane, going, press, press, why are you not closing him down? And you could see what was going to happen. Someone was going to lose their head and go, I'm just going to do it. Because, And that's exactly what Leicester wanted us to do. Leicester are arguably one of the best championship teams we've ever seen. And they are so good at playing, at baiting that press and just beating it. We did so well in that game not to do that. And it was helped by having that inflatable man up top, Ryovic. But, <laughs> like, he won't press, will he? But <laughs> there was the second goal where Kone just steamed in. And he went to the goalkeeper to try and close him down. But as soon as he did that, he left a huge gap behind him, which Ryan Porteous was like, ah, crap. Like, I'm going to have to make this up. And here's this comical sprint, like, wide legs like sort of really giant sprint he's trying to do he's trying to catch I think it was Harry Winks that originally got the ball um and then they just like ping 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 around us and Porteous was just chasing him trying to boot the player which I, I really wanted him to do but he just missed him and they scored within maybe six or seven seconds of that first pass from the goalkeeper and it was exactly what Leicester wanted us to do and that was a point of the game where we were coming into it at 1-0, and I actually think we played quite well that game. And yes, at 2-0, we did put more pressure on them, but you're not going to come back from 2-0 down against a team like Leicester. And I'm pretty sure that probably infuriated Ishmael because when you're, he's so kind of like inflexible with his tactics and you can tell he's quite disciplined in that we have to play this way and, and you need to be really on it in that role. To see a player like that make a, what I think was quite a, obvious error but I don't I haven't seen anyone point it out or call him out for it but it was just yeah it was really naive from Kone and I think that was just a sign of or that was one sorry example of there's been times when Kone sometimes just does something a little bit silly because he is still what 21 years old he will make those errors I think Ishmael just on Saturday was like I can't have it in this game mm. and especially if Kayembe was off it I don't know if he's not fit or he's been rushed back um but yeah, I think once we had Shaq Fataze and Ince on, they carried the ball a lot more and they were, tactically, they were doing the job that was asked of him in that central midfield run with Livermore behind them. And he got a bit of stick actually on Saturday, but I actually think Tom Ince played quite well um, when he came on. He missed two good chances that he probably should have scored, but I actually think he, he played well in that mid, in midfield role. He would have got uh, an absolutely all the plaudits in the world if he'd put one of those two goals behind because it looked like a lot of hard work. If it had just got a couple of goals or got a goal out of it, the the response is, um, yeah, it, more, it feels more purposeful, doesn't it? The the squad, though, itself, you know, Matt, looking at it, it, feeled, it felt on Saturday tired. I think Mike, in one chat I had with him, he called them hungover. There, there, there's a thing about this squad, we know it's limited, 
in many ways uh, in terms of its skill and ability. But we also know it's a, a squad that has been, as as every championship squad has, I suppose we're, we're not sort of saying we're any different. They are being, they have recently playing a lot of games. And again, last week was meant to be a free week where all they had to do was train and go to some Junior Hornets events. They were able to, you think, prepare better for this game than they have for previous games. It didn't happen in that way. But the, the squad have been playing a lot of lot of games. Is that is that my perception? Is that me being feeling like I'm watching lots of Watford, Watford matches all the time? Is 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 that really that different? Do you think should we should we be saying our Watford team is more tired than tighter, more tired than uh, than anybody else? We have we do have the smallest squad, first team squad in the championship as it stands, and we've used 24 different players this season, which is fewer than any other team. Uh, one less than Bristol City and Coventry, uh, who use 25. When you compare that with teams like Stoke, who've used 35, Sheffield Wednesday, Rotherham, Leeds, Hull, have used 33. Um, teams like Hull, especially, they were able to bring a couple of loan players in in January to really boost that squad. Um, we didn't do that. Whether or not that was down to Ishmael not believe, really believing that he didn't need anyone else or whether he's kind of just towing the line and saying that because he wasn't given anyone else. Uh, we don't know. So 17 of the, the squad have played yeah, admittedly, this is an arbitrary number um, 1,200 minutes or more this season, which is, again is a league high, but oddly we've, we've changed the starting 11 quite frequently. So we, even though we had that 24 man squad, We've changed the starting 11 86 times cumulatively over the season, uh, which is the fifth highest. Um, and you can kind of understand the top three in Plymouth, Stoke and Sheffield Wednesday, who have all done over 100 because they changed their manager before the January transfer window. So they would have brought in some new players. The manager would have decided, actually, we want some different a different style of play that doesn't suit those players from before I came in. It's it's quite alarming that we've only had one game this season where we've kept an unchanged starting eleven, and that was between the Norwich three two game at home and the Hull two one uh, win away. Which, or well, the second half especially against Norwich, or the last sixty minutes and the whole game against Hull, I thought we played really well. And that was that period where we were actually getting some consistency. So there's every chance that we could see maybe. 13, 14, 15 of those players play over 2,000 league minutes this season. Before this season, to add some context into that, there have been 456 teams that have played in the championship since 2004-05, and none of those have seen more than 13 players play more than 2,000 minutes. We could break a record there, an unwanted record, I guess. So we've got 13 players of our already league low 24 in the squad are on tra- are tracking to... to- have over 2,000 minutes each, which would be the highest number since 2004, since the championship became the championship. Like, that is extraordinary, really. And and, and the number of changes made to the starting eleven there as well, which we've kind of all become used to. You know, we're sitting in the railway, John, two o'clock before a game, looking at who's who's what are the changes going to be today. But he's making a lot of changes, but we have such a small amount of players. Like he's moving the chess pieces around the board, but he, he hasn't got the pieces that he wants. He hasn't got the options that he wants or or whether he wants them or not. He's, he's, the fact is that he doesn't have enough options to make those changes effective, really. He's moving the same tired, he's moving the same tired players around each game and they're all knackered because there's so few of them. I mean, early on, it felt like he was moving around to sort of figure them out and try them out and see what's happening. New sort of understanding of it. And I do think in the in the railway before games, Dave, we do look, but we aren't looking and going, oh, that's in, mm, yes, cool, ah, we're not doing that anywhere near as we used to, because it, because we don't. You can see the list of players. You can't see how they're being played necessarily, apart from when you say Tom Delabishiri. Where's he playing that first time he was sort of played at the wrong place? Are those? Am I, is it in my head, um, Matt? That we he, he changed things around early, or is that a thing that sort of continued the whole season? Kind of continued the whole season. I mean, it's it's so different to last season where you were talking about kind of like looking at that pre-match lineup, and you'll be like, "Oh, Kalu's still alive," 
Um, and <laughs> like, you'll just have some random guy who forgot is at Watford will still be there. And you'll be like, oh my God, he's starting. You will not, you don't really get any surprises nowadays. You've had a couple on the bench, like of academy players that are filling in, but will never really play. But I do think a lot of it is down to Ishmael's tax, ta- uh, tactical inflexibility. Like he's not willing to change the way they play at all. And at the start of the season, you kind of were seeing some progression in like, okay, I can see what he's trying to do here. But since, or since post, but actually since post Christmas really, isn't it? That Bristol City defeat was probably the first time where it seems to be getting worse all the time. And there's no real plan there. And it, and now it's not working and people have figured out what we're trying to do and figured out that Wesley Hoot is just going to switch that ball 30 times a game. It doesn't seem like we have any answers. We, we can't be like, ah, oh, we're going to change something now and play two up front and, and risk it. That's really interesting because th- that we've reached a position where we're saying Ishmael's inflexible. And... Because he previously he used he, he'd always play a three four three at his at his old club. So when he was at uh, Barnsley West Brom, when he was at Besiktas, and I remember when when he got appointed, I, I remember um, a couple of sort of journo's who cover West Brom and people I know who are West Brom fans were tweeting me saying, "Oh mate, yeah, get ready for three four three. He he's never going to change. He's going to make the subs at the same time as he does every week." Which is that bit came true, but. But he changed the system. He sort of changed his style of football a little bit. It looked like he maybe was trying to evolve. So you'd think that he kind of has, if he wanted to, he would have like an, an alternative system that he knows and, and has used before that he could switch to. Maybe he thinks we don't have the players. But, you know, we do have, he has used four, four different centre-backs this season. So he could go to a back three. We've got players that could play sort of wing-back kind of out wide in that sort of system as well. So it's there. It's there for him if he wanted to do it. But... Again, do we have three strikers? Is these three? Pl- I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just it doesn't work. But I don't know. I think if you played Rayovic, this is me trying to find. <laughs> yeah, to be positive, Rayovic. Could you play for like Dennis and Espria alongside Rayovic or something, and suddenly he'd be fairly useful? Probably not. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean that was an idea of a performance on Saturday from him, wasn't it, as well? We need to raise, we need to talk about that, the header and the shot he had that never, never before have I seen someone look like a competition winner um, up front. Like, it was just embarrassing and I, I felt awful for him. Yeah. Um, but it's just clearly just, he's just not good enough. He just isn't good enough. And as much as I want to like him, last time we spoke, it's got even worse. Um, well, you were, you were sort of on his side last time we spoke. I kind of, I was on his side because I want him to do well. I really want him to do yeah. well. And I'm trying to find the positives there. But after watching Rotherham away and then his substitute performance in on Saturday, just can't win a header. He's six foot four. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's <laughs> like someone said, I think it might be my angry dad, actually, who said it's like watching Rodney Trotter. He's the Danish Rodney Trotter. And it is. He runs like him. He looks like him. Um, and yeah, we've signed a dud there. Who's Del Boy? Pozzo fancies himself as Del Boy, but unfortunately, this time next year, Gino, <laughs> we will not be millionaires. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the last time we recorded, it was definitely glass half full. And the last few performances, even the win at Rotherham, has made me really worried about the rest of the season and how bad it could get and mm. how. I think I'm more worried about how toxic it could get again because this season felt like oh, we, we might be getting somewhere again. Like we have an honest squad, and and that is one thing that is much better than what we've had in recent years. We have a a likable squad. They seem to be playing pretty much to the best of their ability a lot of the time. I don't think that's in question. It's not like we've got players like Saar. Um, I even say João Pedro at some points last season kind of just doing what they want to do, strolling around the pitch. Saar more than anyone else. Keenan Davis as well, kind of just, you knew they could do a lot better than they were. On that point, Matt, there is one bloke who's back now who's doing, who seems to be perhaps doing that. And that's Dennis. And like scored, scored the goal on Saturday. And it was a, it, it was a good bit of skill to take that first touch and then finish it. Bio and Ryevich aren't going to do that. So he, he obviously brings that to the table. 
apart from that, there wasn't a lot there. He doesn't fit in that no. system. He can't play in that system in that role. And the first half, he was pretty anonymous. Um, will we see him again? Maybe not. We don't know how bad this groin injury is, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see him again. And that is, there is, I don't know, you know, who knows? We don't know what goes on at training ground. We, it's, it's easy to sort of wildly speculate about these things, but there does appear to be a correlation between Dennis reappearing and the arse falling out of the whole thing. We haven't, we've, we've not, you know. We've... I'd like to think it isn't that. I, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm still not sure Ishmael wanted him. A hundred percent he didn't. Uh, no way would he have wanted him. Uh, again, speaking to Mike, he absolutely 100% says that only one man made that decision, and it was Gino. And it was, a, it was, it was cheap, and he thought he was going to get a lot more from it. He buried him after that Norwich game as well, didn't he? Okay, he blamed him for the defeat, didn't he? Ishmael, when uh, I brought him on, he did nothing, uh, get, kept giving the ball away. Dennis was brilliant in... 75% of that relegation season was one of our bright sparks and at times looked unplayable against good defences. Um, but it was very... The, the, the danger with Dennis, it was always very much me, me, me. Um, it's all about me. And it was so much about him on Saturday. Yeah, On, on Saturday, when he... At kickoff, straddling the, the, the ball in the centre circle, doing his prayers. Like, you could not even do anything more centre of attention, even if you tried in front of near on 20,000 people looking straight at you. It was a little yeah. bit, it just I, was a little bit over the top. I know what you mean. I mean, look, players pray, praying for a game, that's fair enough. Not people, with that. People that's do that. Saying. But Where like, the ball, yeah, having the ball nestled so neatly between <laughs> his thighs as he did it was certainly a choice. Uh, and even the celebration, he got the ball and again, he sort of got the ball out the neck. It's like, come on, let's 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 crack on. But he kind of ended up, he was sort of like celebrating on his own. He kind of ran away. He, all the players kind of ran in to celebrate. He just legged it off in the other direction with the ball. Which, again, look, it's, it's, it's you know, you can read far too much into these sort of things, but it kind of, the optics of it for me weren't great. I mean, and then, and then two minutes later, he sat down and he's done his groin. So that, as you say, could be, could be the end of that. Could be a blessing in disguise. Back, I mean, Bayo's back. They reckon not this weekend, the weekend after. That would be helpful because we've got nobody else. Um, I mean, at what point do we start thinking, can we dip into the under-21s or under-23s? Is there anyone in there? I mean, Adiemo's back now from injury. He's nowhere near fit. Uh, Lacan Torres is doing okay recently in the under-21s. I, I saw them play a couple of weeks ago in a friendly at Hitchin, my local team, so I thought I'd go down and watch and... Torres was one of the players who looked pretty handy. Apart from that, didn't seem really anyone there that would... Uh, but you, you can't tell from those games, can you? I mean, I, I watched Andrews play a couple of times in under-21s and he never stood out. So you never really know, do you? Talking of Andrews, you know, mm. there's, there, there is this strange mm. feeling that you have. The fact that on post-match on Saturday, well, before the game on Saturday, Tom Deli Bashiru is playing again. And it's been a few weeks since Andrews has been injured or been rested or whatever it is. And Gakia is just coming back. But it has been a few weeks now since Tom keeps getting picked. And that yeah. is bizarro, I think, to, do, to, for, for, to go on this long at least, to put someone who isn't quite in that position to someone who is, yes, very new to that position or new to the professional side of it. But also the fact that he played... Um, he didn't play Morris ahead of... Um, Lewis, who post match Val said that he had um, a muscle problem, and they mm. so, he's he's out so he's making choices. But those those fullbacks, particularly, you know, why why not why not Ryan Andrews, who we fall in love with? And I'm, I'll be absolutely honest, and I say that, in a, I don't I don't say that jokingly, but there is always that lovely romantic side when young players come through. I do remember when Toby scored last year, the high I felt for several days afterwards. Hmm. Purely came down for the fact, A, we won a game, which as we found out is very rare in the last few years, but <laughs> also the fact that it was him and his goal and it was youth and I'm of an age where that's just so important to me. Yeah. And and that's where Andrews has sort of been great that he's he's come in, he's done something and he's slowly plodded along. Why not play him? So, Deli Bashiru, in this system, between those two players, Andrews and Deli Bashiru, is, is the 
ideal player to play in that position because so much of the system relies on that right back coming inside to play almost as a in fill in as a central midfielder, an extra central midfielder in possession. Um, Delhi Bashiri, one thing that he is really good at, and let's ignore Saturday's performance because he was not good at that on Saturday, is keeping the ball. Like he's he's very good at retaining the ball. He's he's strong in possession, um, and he plays accurate passes, which is what you want someone to do. You want to keep that ball um, because whenever you have the ball, you're on the attack. Delhi Bashiri's passing accuracy this season is actually the best in the squad. So it's around 90%, just under, I think it was 89.8 or something. That's four percentage points above everyone else. Uh, Ishmael Coney is the second best. So his ball retention is really good. And that is obviously important in the way that Ishmael wants to play. Ngakia, another right back option now he's fit. Uh, also, he's pretty good at ball retention. I actually do really like Ngakia. Um, I think he gets a bad rep. Um, and the fans... Watford fans are very quick, and I, I can't say this about any other fans because I don't know. I'm not a fan of any other club. But Watford fans make their mind up very quickly on players and very rarely change that opinion on players. And Gakia quite quickly, I, don't, I wouldn't say he's not a boo boy, is he? But fans don't seem to like him because there is an error in him. Mm. But that's fine. He's still fairly young, but he's got quite clearly got very big confidence issues as well in Gakia. When it's going well for him, he's brilliant. There's been a couple of performances this season, this season where he's played really well um, and been such a threat in that right-back role coming forward, in that inverted right-back role, especially on the opening day. Can't Gakia. get can't get running the team, can't stay fit. That's the problem. So we, we see we see it in fits and starts. We see good moments here and there. You see bad games, which may or may not be his fault. But it, it's just we haven't had the chance for him to be a regular fixture in the team for long enough for us all to kind of get to, you know, come around to him, I suppose. And he doesn't have the academy premium that Andrews has. To be fair to Ngakia, like, because of that reason, I do think it's baffling. I I don't know if it is confirmed that he signed that four-year contract or that was just a a rumour. That is a baffling decision uh, to do that. Now, Ryan Andrews. So I'm going to start this by saying that, obviously, I think he's a fantastic prospect. I think that, like you, John, I get excited when academy... I want to see more academy players, and I love the fact that he's breaking into the team. He has obvious traits that give us something, just not in this uh, formation or this system, I don't think. I, I think he's very careless in possession. He has the lowest passing accuracy of every player in the Watford squad that isn't Maleta Rajevic. I mean, that pass completion rate of 69% is not good. And that doesn't include crosses before anyone else right. goes, well, he gets the ball and fires them in. He's careless in possession. And defensively, he isn't great yet because he's still so young. This is a player that hasn't been out on a loan spell anywhere. He's come straight into that first team and is learning on the job. So you expect that from a player like Ryan Andrews. So there's nothing, there's no kind of, I'm not saying, oh, this guy's rubbish. He shouldn't be in the team. I expect this from him and fans should expect terrors from him. But he's just, I, I think there's there's valid reasons why players like Deli Bashir and Ngaki are ahead of him. And what the fans have quickly forgotten how much of a nightmare Andrews had in that fir- uh, first half against Bristol City in that 4-1 defeat of right back. He, it was one of the worst right-back performances I've seen from a Watford player, uh, again, probably because he's so young and inexperienced, and he got hauled off at half-time. And Watford fans just seem to have completely forgotten about some of the performance and, uh, performances Andrews had this season. Um, so I don't get the clamour for him to be going, he's our best right-back option, he should definitely be starting in our current system. If we were to play wing-backs, yes. Everything that he has as a weakness is often outweighed by the strength of being so quick um, that it is just such a threat on the break. So if you were to play more counter-attacking football and play wing-backs, then that is excellent. Um, Use that. Use that to your advantage. But I just think in this system, there's too many question marks about his ball retention and his game intelligence, again, to be expected because he's so young, 
to make him a regular in the side. I think you you play him every so often to give him experience. And as soon as we are safe from relegation, it sounds stupid to say we're definitely not going to get in the playoffs because we're definitely not going to get in the playoffs. Then that's when you play him. Give him minutes like Chris Wilder did last season. But he is not this £10 million player that everyone's like, we're going to lose Andrews in the summer. He's a future England international. I've not seen anything yet that suggests that is the case. Um, he's a good championship prospect at the moment for me. Um, but I absolutely want to be proved wrong and love to be proved wrong. That's really interesting. Perhaps a partial proof of what you're saying in terms of how Ishmael views him could be seen recently when he came on. I can't remember that. It was one of the recent home games where we were chasing it and he was brought on. As a Leicester, he was brought on and played kind of right wing, basically. He, I, I, you, you were thinking, oh, well, he's going to come on the right back. Delhi Bashir is going to go into midfield. And it, no, it didn't. Delhi Bashir stayed at right back and Andrews was up right up high on the right wing trying to, you know, get to the byline. And he's, he's good at that. And we've seen flashes. And, I, and 100%, there's an emotional element around it because we've had so few academy players, an absolute dearth of academy players for so long. He's the first one that's come in, looked capable on his day of playing championship football in the England under 19 squad or whatever. There's, there's potential there. There's a story there. His dad played for Watford. Like we, we like him. We want him to do well. So I think we do perhaps ignore or maybe, maybe and, and it's, it's a, it's, it's a good thing. We, we cut him some slack. You know, we should cut players more slack on the whole across the board, probably. So I understand why people want him in the team and stuff, but it, the, the, the stuff that you've said about the, the numbers, like, that's pretty pretty damning. It's dangerous to look at one single metric standalone, but it's kind of backing up what I'm seeing with my own eyes there. And I do I, I see that he is careless in possession at times and makes poor decisions. I was looking at the creative numbers as well. Like he's got the lowest open play chances created per 90 average in the Watford squad of non-central defenders. So it's not even like he's a great creative outlet for us going forward either from fullback, which a lot of people say he is. The numbers just don't back that up. But watching it emotionally, you know that the fans do love it when he gets the ball and he runs down the yeah, wing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's attack, I love it. attack, attack. And, and that just skews, I suppose, so much. And people forgive, I suppose, for losing the ball a bit more because, as you know, you, you, it's, it's going to raise excitement. Uh, and that's really what, a, a, a huge proportion of fans just want that. Yeah, and I think Ishmael's protecting him in some ways as well, a yeah. bit from some of this. There were rumours on social media where you always get this, well, you might have a bit of an attitude problem. I think that's just, uh, that's a load of crap for me. I, I don't see that. I think you're right to mention that, Matt, because on the, um, you know, on the post-match uh, show that Do Not Scratch Your Eyes do on, on after the games, I was listening to the one on... On Saturday, and and an awful lot of people, pretty much every person I heard for the for sort of half an hour I was listening, mentioned Andrews as like couldn't believe that Andrews wasn't in the team, and for you know, that's valid opinion, and for the reasons that we've mentioned, maybe. But it's it's a it sort of it's a bit of a dangerous position for him to be in, like for him to be the savior. But I, you know, it's a bigger picture here. Putting Ryan Andrews back in this team doesn't solve all the problems, and you certainly don't want to burden him with that level of responsibility either this kid started the season as an, an just turning as he, he was 18 i think at the start of the season he turned 19 during the season he's still so young so inexperienced and needs plenty more years at championship level to get anywhere near a, a standard where premier league clubs will be looking at him um i think that at, at this stage and I'm, I am not a professional football scout by any means, but there's as much chance of him becoming a Premier League footballer as there's him becoming an, a National League footballer. Um, I think people sometimes mistake athleticism, his pace for kind of on-the-ball quality or uh, things like that. I think that compensates for it. And I think that also brings up another fullback in our squad. I, I want to mention about James Morris. He gets a lot of stick as well. I don't think... Technically, especially, he's no worse than Andrews, absolutely, in my opinion. Um, he doesn't have the pace, what that's for sure. He's probably safer in terms of he will make an easy pass and not one that might create a brilliant chance for someone. I kind of want that from a fullback. And I absolutely have not seen any more in Jamal Lewis than I have James Morris this season, a left back. So from now on, 
I would rather see James Morris, who is an academy prospect and could be a decent player for us over the years. And yeah, I know he's 22. He's hardly kind of Ryan Andrews' teenager style. But Lewis will be gone at the end of the season. He's on, he's on loan and I can't see us signing him, I pray. Why not play Morris more often as well? Matt, I saw a thing. I think the club did a load of... They, they, they were sh- hooting and hollering about the fact that we've got the most number of goals in the Championship from, from distance, from outside the box. It doesn't surprise, I suppose, for most fans because we know that there are not many goals being scored inside the box, um, or at least they were th- the threats aren't necessarily coming from there as regular as we, as we want. But where, where's that coming from? Not tell me where the stats coming from, but I mean, where and why do you think we're sort of dependent on that? Desperation, maybe. <laughs> I think a lot of the time we have players like we know Kone has got a shot on him. He likes to shoot. There's been times it actually probably comes back to what I was saying earlier where. Sometimes he just thinks, you know what, stuff it. I'm just going to go for it myself. Um, we've got 15 goals from outside the box this season in league competition, which is yeah more than any other team uh, in the top four tiers. And we've also had the fourth most shots from outside the box as well with 200. You do see it like on Saturday, you saw some kind of desperation towards the end of just trying anything. I mean, when you've got Wesley Hoot in the side as well, you're going to have a few long-range strikes from ridiculous. I think, was it Leicester where he tried to chip the keeper from his own half again, but mm-hmm. this time more than anywhere near? I think it's more of kind of just a, a thing rather than a trend. It just so happens that we've yeah, had a bit of luck. We've had, I mean, as I said, we've had the fourth most shots from outside the box. Some of those have just got lucky and gone in. There's been some brilliant goals in there. Think of all those players. We've got Espria, Chak Fatadze, Martins... Even Andrews, even sometimes Ngakia has a pop from range. As you say, Hoot, KMB has had a couple shot, maybe a bit closer, but he kind of, you know, if there's a chance to shoot, he'll take it. Like, yeah, Livermore's boosted that. Unusual for him, but he got two in one game against the, against QPR. And then I think he tried another one against Bristol City the next game. It didn't work. But, um, yeah, so maybe it's just down to players. But it's quite a rare thing in mod, in modern football. For that, that, that's, that seems to be a lot less common these days you know it's the classic kind of get to the byline the cut the, the man city cut back is kind of what you do these days rather than um waste chance shooting from a from a low xg position yeah that's the the rise of analytics has kind of yeah helped that work the ball into better positions you're more likely to score so shoot less from outside the box i think that um yeah from what what we've seen so far this watford team just says to hell with analytics we'll uh We'll just do what we want. Uh, so I, I think there's every chance now we won't score another goal from outside the box towards the end of the season. We had a bit of a hot streak, uh, but we yeah we've been blessed with some goals. I mean that Aspria goal at Norwich was up there with one of the best I've seen by a Watford player. I could not believe it when it went in. Is there a record? You need to have a look at the record. Do you remember a few years ago when we nearly broke the nutmegs record, or when we you know we had the nutmegs yeah. record? Um, it'd be nice if there was like something at the end of the season. If we're like one off having the most ever long range goals from outside the box in the championship ever, and on the whole, the last game we you know we're, we're safely mid safely mid table <laughs> every time anyone gets the ball. Shoot! I've just looked at last season. Barnsley scored twenty one goals from outside oh, the okay. box last season. That was the most in the top top four tiers. So that's something to aim for. I guess that's our next aim. Excellent. Well, what about this? Yeah, we're we going to get a few more of these podcasts for the end of the season. But, you know, in the run-in, Matt, you know, are you, you've sort of said how, you know, desperation might be a, a, a thing if we keep this current trend going. You know, is it is it as bad as I, as we, as we as Watford fans feel it's going to be, do you think? We have got a tough run-in. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you look, even on paper, you look at that, we still, Got to play a lot of the teams in the top half. Um, so I ran, this is a really non-scientific way of doing it, but I had 10 minutes, so I thought I'd try it. <laughs> so I looked at all of the teams in the championship and their opponents' points per game on average left to play this season. And Watford actually have the hardest run in. Um, so our opponents, their current average points per game is 1.55, um, which is just ahead of Blackburn and Southampton, interestingly, who are probably out of the the uh, automatic promotion race already. You look down towards the bottom of the supposed easiest run-ins. You've got teams like Rotherham, Sheffield, Wednesday, Plymouth, Cardiff. There's a few teams down there, Millwall. If they start winning points, if we lose on Saturday, I'm still a little bit worried about it could 
go south quite quickly. Would changing a manager help that? Probably not. Yeah, I'm still a little bit worried at the moment. But yeah, we, we'll have to wait and see what happens this week, I think. That's really interesting, that point. Because, Matt, when we, get to these, when we get to these situations... And Gino may still be thinking like this. Gino, Gino might may be sort of refusing to consider the possibility that we could go down. Um, but normally we go, oh, maybe it's worth the last spin of the dice, last roll of the dice, just in case we get into the playoffs, which is what happened last season or whatever. Whereas now the risk is that the, the playoffs are not going to happen. We're 11 points off. You know, when we beat QPR, we were one point off. Now we're 11 points off. It's gone going to be really hard to get in there and there's only two spots up for grabs anyway really but the, so the so the, the risk is it's not worth it because the risk that you bring someone in and it completely falls apart then we go down if we go you know it's, it's not inconceivable I don't think we will but we can easily be dragged in and then you know it could be a scenario where like three games before the end of the season he does it again he fires another one you know and, we, and to try and save it like we did with Pearson in the Premier League and everything. So like you could easily see how this could there could be a death spiral here and we could be in real trouble because those games, yeah, they are tough. We play a lot of the sort of promotion contenders, playoff contenders in the last few weeks of the season. We've got Ipswich, who will still be going for it. Middlesbrough last day of the season, Sunderland penultimate game of the season. Southampton are in there. Leeds, we still got played Leeds as well. And as you said, Mill, he, he, like Millwall on paper, yeah, they're down there. But that's going to be a tough game. Neil Harris is back. We did, we, you know, we've not always done well there. Beat Southampton away. Yeah, the weekend, I, I went to that so. game last season and oh, it was a disaster. I mean, me and Kieran left after 70 minutes or something. It was complete shambles. And it could easily be that situation again on Saturday. You wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't be surprised. But hopefully our, yeah, the fact that it's away, maybe that gives us a little bit of hope. But yeah, I, th- I just think, I think we're at a really interesting point here because... Yes, it does seem a little bit like, you know, we were hearing things at the weekend that he's gone or he's going to go. It seems like nothing, obviously Monday night, no announcement yet, no corner flag yet, but maybe they're going to give him one more game or maybe there's some internal kind of uh, differences of opinion as to whether this would be a wise thing to do right now. They'll def- def- definitely be talked about, I'm certain of that. Um, but I think maybe you just, the pragmatic thing to do would be just to sit on it just gets to mid table vow and then what will be will be in the summer. I'll be too sensible, Dave. <laughs> why would what could do that? But again, like we said this in the last pod. It's kind of like we are a mid table squad and we are mid table. So we're above teams like Middlesbrough, who have they were in the playoffs last season, should be doing better than they are. Um Bristol City, I've got a good young squad, I think they're a good side. They play really good football. They tore us apart this season. One of the be- best teams we've seen at Vicarage Road. We're doing all right, really. Um, it's just a bit dull and boring because we all think we should be challenging for promotion. Um, but I-, I think we've always said we're a mid-table side. I think we'll do well to finish in the top 12 this season. I think we'll probably end up doing around that. Where Where is it going to go from here? So Next season, what's what's the plan? If if Ishmael does go, like it's, it's just going to be the same again. And it was someone else in charge. It's just we need some kind of. I just really want a season where we we've, we've completed it with a manager. We've done it. We there you go. We can sack as many as you want next season. We've done one season with a manager again. Yeah, I, I don't want him to go. I, I think it'd be an error. I just don't think it's worth the risk. And I still feel that, like he has already this season. We can still turn it around a little bit with a with a bit of luck. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed, everybody. Thank you very much, DCW. Thank you, and thank you, Matt. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back with another from the Rookie end, maybe sooner rather than later, uh, depending on what news comes out. But of course, we're back after the Millwall game uh, for a chat about how things go at the New Den. Can we still call it the New Den? It's pretty old these days. The old New Den. The old New Den. Come on, you on. 